Okay, well, welcome everybody to uh, Local Stories. Uh, it's July and um, we've been really enjoying these sessions. Each one is about the history of local people and places. And this time, um, for this month's session, we decided to look at sport. Um, as you probably all know, uh, the Euros have just finished and many of us watched that and uh, the England team did absolutely brilliantly, really, um, really amazing. And there's lots of other sport going on too, Wimbledon and cricket and rugby and the Olympics start next week, which is really exciting too. So we thought it would be a really good opportunity to look at the history of some of our local sports clubs. So i uh, really delighted that we've got three speakers um, this afternoon, um, each of whom is going to give us a history of one of our sports clubs. So we'll be looking at cr um, cricket, rugby and football. Um, so uh, for each person, they're really happy to take questions afterwards. So if you want to uh, ask a question, you can. Um, and um, uh, otherwise we can take a few questions at the end and then I've got a very quick quiz if we've got time for it um, picking up on some of the things that our speakers might say so we're going to kick off with cricket and really pleased we've got David McIntosh um, here this afternoon uh, he's been associated with the cricket club for over 50 years as a player captain chairman and now on the voluntary ground staff uh, he's also the only Amersham player to have captained the senior Buckinghamshire side. So uh, I think he probably is really well placed to talk about Amersham Cricket Club. So over to you, David. You're okay. there. Brilliant. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Emily, for that uh, very nice introduction. And, and also a thanks to Gary for um, inviting me to give this little, this little presentation. Um, given that the, the Cricket Club is now... Uh, is in its 165th year, uh, a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes or so, is probably going to be quite difficult to do, it, to do that period of time uh, uh, complete justice. But I'll, I've selected a few uh, uh, photographs from the, from the history of the club and, and we'll just uh, dwell on, on them as we go through. Um, although the, the club officially started in 1856, um, uh, there are some newspaper reports uh, strangely enough, about Amersham, in, about matches involving Amersham as early as the 1820s, um, but there have not there weren't any official records. Um, and the first hundred years booklet of Amersham Cricket Club started from 1856 to 1956. So uh, we assume that the formal um, commencement was in fact 18, uh, 1856. The the club uh, logo, which uh, appears on your screen there just now. Um, obviously, the Amersham Cricket Club founded in 1856, Roundel, and in the middle is the family crest of the Tirrett Drake family, who've had um, uh, an association with the club ever since it was founded um, as players and, and uh, chairman and presidents and so on. And the current uh, joint president of the club is Bill Tirrett uh, Drake, um, continuing that long association with the, with the club. Sorry, if you can see in the, in the, in the background of me, I've, I've now got a window cleaner cleaning the windows behind me. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, this second slide um, shows a very early uh, photograph and uh, apologies for the, obviously the quality uh, in a small screen, it's not going to come up too clearly. But this is a photograph of uh, a match played at Amersham in, uh, 19, in 1873 indeed, married against singles. Um, and those of you who've been around for a number of years might remember that oak tree behind them, which in fact was taken down for safety reasons about 12 years ago. And then the field behind that is the, um, is the Shardlow's uh, uh, farm field. Uh, behind the oak tree is the, ro the road leading up to Shardlow's house. Um, there's a few uh, local familiar names involved in this, uh, in this match. The, one of the umpires was called Weller. Uh, there's, some, there's some Dumbartons, some Glenisters. Uh, quite um, uh, significant local local names, local uh, associated with local families. Just note the headgear of the fellows there. Don't think they would do much to stop um, fast bowling nowadays of, of, of head height, uh, given the nature of the helmets that uh, that currently exist. This is um, uh, a, a, a photograph of the of the uh, first eleven in its return. It, to Shardlow's in 1929. The reason for the return is that um, 
Uh, in the early years, Amersham had um, a couple of stints at Barn Meadow. Um, first of all, from 1886 to 1905, and then from 1908 to 1929. Uh, and from 1929 onwards, um, uh, the club has been at, uh, at the Shardlows uh, Park. Uh, and this particular photograph shows you uh, the team, the first team at that time. Um, the um, gentleman in front in the middle, um, as the captain, H.R. Hoare, Joe Hoare, uh, had an over 70 year association with the, the club. Again, uh, quite a well known local family. Um, <clears throat> and similarly, the um, Tom Orton and Hugh Orton, that uh, is a pretty well known local family too. Uh, the, um, there doesn't seem to be much commonality in the colours and the pullovers, a bit, a bit of a mix there, a little bit different from nowadays when, when all clubs have got a, a kind of a, a, a corporate kind of style and all the guys are wearing the same, the same colours. This is not a great photograph, but it's taken not far from that oak tree, but looking in the other direction. It's now looking across the old ground in the 50s, up towards uh, Shardlow's house at the top of the hill. You can't actually see it through the trees. Um, but up in that gap there between those two big trees, uh, there is now what's called Lower, Lower Park House, um, <clears throat> currently shielded by the trees, but um, that was built in the, uh, in the 70s, I, I, I think. Um, and you can see that the, the, the area beyond the, the playing field uh, just looks like, just like farm fields. All of that now, um, certainly to the middle, the middle uh, hedge there <coughs> now uh, belongs, or at least on a long leash, to the, to the cricket club. Moving forward from there, just um, I mentioned earlier about the first hundred years of the club. Uh, the left hand side of that slide is a short history of Amersham Cricket Club 1856 to 1956. Um, <coughs> an interesting booklet if you're into that kind of thing. And then on the right hand side of the, um, of the screen is a variety of different um, fixture cards uh, from the early uh, 1900s through until, well, we don't have fixture cards nowadays. It's not necessarily everything digital and electronic. But I would draw you to the one in the middle at the bottom there, draw your attention to that. Uh, Amersham United Cricket Club 1903, which suggests that there were a number of cricket teams in Amersham which came together and merged together <coughs> uh, as Amersham United, which has then subsequently uh, just shortened to Amersham, Amersham Cricket Club. Now, a couple of uh, slides. Um, just illustrating some special matches that the club has held. Um, this particular one is the centenary match, so that is 1956. Um, uh, and uh, there are some quite illustrious individuals in that uh, photograph. Not easy to read the names, but could I point out uh, and draw attention to a couple in particular? The gentleman in the suit uh, standing under the clock is uh, Douglas Jardine, who was the captain of the England uh, or the MCC cricket team in Australia during the famous Bodyline uh, tour. He was an extremely unpopular individual with the Australians, as you might know. Curiously, standing next to him on his right with the cap is an Australian called Jack Fingleton, who was a very, very well-known uh, broadcaster, post-war broadcaster on, uh, on cricket, a very learned man about uh, cricket. Won't go into any of the detail on the, of the rest of the players there, but other than to point out, the gentleman in the suit in the middle is uh, Joe Hoare. He was the, the captain in, 19, uh, in 1929, and he features in a couple more slides that I've got to, got to show you. And in particular, uh, this, one, this one here, there's Joe again sitting in the middle row. This is another um, uh, celebration. This indeed was the Queen's Jubilee ce celebration uh, match that was had in uh, 1977. Um, the other person I'd like to just point out, some of you might recognise a few of the faces, the, the chap with his arms folded um, just in front of the oak tree, again that oak tree features, uh, is Ian Rogers. Ian is the current uh, chairman of, of uh, <coughs> Amersham Cricket Club. Now moving on from there, um, those of you cricket aficionados will almost certainly know the two gentlemen on the left. Uh, the, the extension to the, to the Cricket Club Pavilion in 1984, officially opened by those two gentlemen. The one on the left is Bill Edrich, 
and the other is Dennis Compton, two uh, very famous England cricketers of the time, uh, and after whom the two stands at Lords, which have recently been extended, the Compton and Edrich stands are, uh, are named. Um, the clubhouse looks quite different now. Um, we, we were recently had the opportunity to um, receive from funding from the HS2 Community Fund, and the roof has completely been refurbished. Uh, all the windows have been replaced, and that cladding that you can see behind the gentleman standing there has all been replaced, along with um, a decking that runs along from the veranda there all the way along the front of the of the clubhouse. So it's extremely, extremely smart. Thank you very much to HS2 for that. So some good news there. Um, sadly, um, from the last photograph to this photograph, um, uh, Bill Edrich died, and this was a memorial match in his name with his wife sitting in the front row there with Alan Pegley, uh, the chairman at the time. Um, again, a few famous faces to point out from previous years. Bottom left there is Godfrey Evans with his, uh, his trademark butcher chops um, uh, sideburns. Two along from him is Clive Rad Radley, Middlesex in England. Uh, and then on the other side of Alan Pegley on the front row, you've got Dennis Compton and then Tom Graveney, uh, uh, England stalwart. And next to them, a chap called Eddie Barlow, who was a South African uh, stalwart. But just like to point out two fellows leaning on the veranda fence there. Um, some of you locals may know. The one on the left is Ronnie Colclough. Uh, the one in the middle is Peter Jackson, who uh, was a player and chairman of the club, both of whom have, uh, have, have since sadly died. Um, moving on from that, uh, just to illustrate that it's not all about serious cricket at Amersham, this was in the 1989, uh, gents versus the ladies. Um, uh, the gents are all crocs, really, I think, as you might see a bit of a wearing mixed garb there. One or two familiar faces that some of you know, Ronnie Colclough again on the left uh, front uh, back row, third from the left, uh, and two eagle landlords, or two ex-eagle landlords, <clears throat> Ray Charlwood uh, on the back next to Ronnie Colclough in the middle there, and John Poor uh, kneeling on the right-hand side. Some of you may well have been served a, a nice pint by then. And then on the ladies' team on the right, 1989, um, <clears throat> sitting on the left there is, is uh, Annie Hamilton Pike, possibly better known as uh, Annie Bazard, one of the, the well-known local Bazard uh, family. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see it, but on the bottom right there uh, is, happens to be my wife who was uh, playing in that particular match. Good. Moving on to my penultimate uh, slide. Um, this uh, picture of young men was the Amersham under-15 team that played uh, in, the, in the national final, Porton Building Society national final. We got to the absolute final game and lost narrowly. Um, uh, most of those boys are still playing cricket, some in Amersham, uh, some elsewhere. Um, the one on the back, uh, the tallest one on the back row there, dark-haired fellow, is uh, some of you may recognise as Alex Hales. Uh, who was an extremely well-known cricketer for England in one day and 2020 cricket. Sadly, he's since blotted his copybook on a couple of occasions and has, uh, has uh, really fallen out of favour with Owen Morgan and his colleagues. And then the final uh, slide, um, just to represent a little bit of the scenic nature of the, of the ground. Extremely, uh, extremely well manicured. Um, and uh, a lovely backdrop over the top of the pavilion that doesn't actually show the new roof uh, as yet. We need to update this photograph. Um, in conclusion then, um, having started in, in 1856 with, uh, with one team and probably no more than about seven matches in the season, uh, the club now runs uh, four, yes, four 11s on a Saturday. Um, and that's helped by the fact that we also have the, uh, the ground at Little Kings Hill lovely village ground with our thirds and fourths uh, play. Um, we also have two Sunday 11s and we have a very strong and vibrant uh, Colts uh, section and uh, Emily's um, uh, sons uh, uh, play in, in that and we reckon we've got about a couple of hundred um, um, Colts um, it, pretty much uh, with a cricket activity at the ground every night of the week. So thank you very much for, um, for, for listening to that and happy to take any questions uh, either now or at, at the end. Thank you.
Thank you, David. That was great. Um, and certainly uh, you've got at least one person in your photographs in the audience because I saw Annie has logged on. So um, <laughs> she'll be pleased to see that. Um, I've got a question to start with, which is when did women first play at the club? Uh, well, leaving, yes, leaving aside that 1989 um, uh, kind of old crops against ladies match, I would say probably not until the early 2000s um, um, and probably the best known is uh, I mentioned the chairman Ian Rogers his daughter Alex who um, was a, a sort of ladies county player she was probably in the vanguard of that now Alex is probably 13 or so we're probably talking early 2000s but there are um, and you probably know this Emily there are quite a few girls now participating in court section and I think on a Friday evening we actually have a girls evening which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, so sometimes the girls play, uh, join with other clubs and play matches, and sometimes the girls mix in with, uh, you know, with the lads, and uh, and and they they play as part of uh, as part of those teams. So not until relatively recently is the answer to your question. No. Okay. Thank Shame you. On you Amersham. Shame on you. Yeah, <laughs> that's Annie. Uh, Annie, have you got a question, or has anyone else got a question? You can just unmute yourself and ask. I'm sure David's happy to take any. Stuart here. Have, um, has Amersham got any current players for the county team? Uh, that's, hello Stuart, that's a, that's a, that, that's a good, uh, good question. Um, uh, the answer to that is no, not that I don't think there are any of uh, uh, the requirements. No, actually that, that is not strictly true. We have our, um, we have one, uh, the, um, uh, our coach, uh, Michael Payne, uh, joined us this year from Tring, and Michael was a former uh, Bucks uh, captain, um, but uh, he's the he's the only one. But he, in a sense, predated joining joining Amersham, so we get the benefit of him as an excellent coach and also playing in our Saturday first eleven. Uh, no others at the present time, sadly. But there are in the Colts. There certainly are, aren't there? In the younger ranks, some of the children are all playing county cricket, aren't they? I know. Oh yes, yes, I think quite a lot. Sorry, I'm assuming that Stuart was meaning yes. on, the, on the senior, well, we, yeah. the senior team. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Peter. You've got your hand up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry if I was a bit delayed in joining you, uh, David. Just curiosity. I'm very impressed that you've got four uh, teams coming out on a. Is this at a weekend or is it always on Saturday? Uh, Saturday, four Saturday yes. elevens, yes. So have we got any, any secrets you can pass on to the rugby club as to how we get players so we can have four teams like we used to have? Indeed, we had seven. Are you going to give the talk on the rugby club, Peter? No, I'm not. I'm just <laughs> asking the question so we can pinch the ideas. <laughs> well, well, I think good management, good organisation, and I think a key thing is, um, is the involvement and the, of the captains. You need, mm -hmm. you need good captains. You need good captains... Uh, uh, who are prepared to work hard to get uh, you know lads out, out to play and yeah, be consistent exactly. and be consistent with it, Peter. Mm. Um, you and I know from our experiences as well we do. as we do. the rugby club just how important that is. Yeah. So, no, so right. yeah. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, yes, David. I was going to ask: uh, Has any first-class cricket ever been played at uh, uh, at Sharglows? Yes. Yes, um, uh, there were I, 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 there are two games in particular I can think about. Richard, 1971, uh, Bucks played Glamorgan in the first round of what was then called the Gillette Cup. You know, the One Day Cup. It then became the Nat West Cup, um, and uh, narrowly lost by four runs. A minor county team had never beaten a major county by that, uh, that stage, uh, and I happened to be playing in that game, and we lo we lost by four runs. Um, the second game, I think, was the following year, the beginning of the season, uh, that was a representative game in the, what was called the Benson and Hedges Cup competition, uh, <clears throat> uh, Minor Counties South, so that was a, a selection of players from the Minor Counties in the south of the country, uh, played uh, Hampshire um, in a, in a, in a one-day game. Um, Hampshire had the very famous opening pair of Gordon, uh, uh, Gordon Greenwich, and um, uh, gosh, his name just escaped me. Barry Richards, the uh, the South African, uh, two of the world's best best opening batsmen and best cricketers, um, I happened to be playing in that game as well. It was at the end of April, 
uh, straight from the rugby season in, into the cricket season. Um, Grinney scored 155, he just whacked it about all over the place. And uh, the, the, the minor counties team were chasing about 350, which uh, proved a little <laughs> bit too difficult to, to, uh, to chase down. Other than those two games, we've had lots of um, county, Buck County representative games and uh, uh, special anniversary games and so on you've seen. But those, I think, are the only two first class uh, type matches that we've played on the ground. <clears throat> David, is it true? Is there a game usually where um, Bill Tirrett Drake comes back every year? Is that right? Is it yes, yes, uh, there's a president. Uh, we've got joint presidents. So, Bill and um, uh, Alan Pegley, who featured in some of the photographs there, Alan is the joint president with Bill. They have a, they have a president's match uh, uh, at, uh, at some point on a Sunday during the course of the season. Uh, Bill used to play in that. Um, but uh, one of his sons now captains the, uh, the President's Eleven. They bring a variety of different players down and uh, that's usually quite a nice social occasion. Great. Well, thank you very much, David. That was really interesting, really informative. Um, it's great to hear about you know, what a long and illustrious history the club has. Thank you. We're going to move now on to rugby. So Gary, uh, chairman of uh, the museum, uh, has very kindly agreed to talk about the um, about Chiltern Rugby Club. So where he first became involved when his son was aged eight in 1977, and he then played himself uh, in his late 30s until his mid 40s, when hurting his knee prevented him from playing any further. He was, though, on the committee as membership secretary for a number of years, and then, in his words, he gracefully retired to the bar. So he's going to tell us a little bit about the rugby club. So, um, Gary, um, right. and over to you. Green. How's that? Great. Yep, you're on. I am. Um... This is actually the second slide, but uh, I, I thought it worth mentioning some of the background of rugby uh, before talking about the uh, rugby club in Amersham. This is a picture uh, of rugby school and the melee of players, fortunately in two different outfits, so they were dis distinguishable. But some of the games they played involved hundreds of people with a round ball, and it wasn't until... Um, William Webb Ellis in 1923 uh, picked up the ball and theory has it and, and history has it that he started running with the ball in hand uh, and that was supposed to be the start uh, of rugby in, in the country. Uh, the boys at rugby school established the rules in 1845. Yes it was the boys and they established the rules of rugby that are still used today many of them and the terminology uh, in the original rules can still be found in the laws. Knock on, things like knock on, onside, offside, fair catch, try, goal, place kick, 25 at five yard line, touch judge, scrummage and in goal. All those terms were established then and they're still used today, which is uh, marvellous. And they, they dress in some strange garb. Um, so I, next part, no. As you can see, and notice the ball on this uh, drawing uh, is actually a, an oval ball, uh, which the players then found easy to kick and pass. Uh, more strange garb, uh, and, and it's, the tradition continued because some of the Vets games, you could relate to some of these early games, uh, in the current Vets side being um, less respectful. Uh, however, Chiltern started, uh, they were called the Chiltern Wanderers at the beginning because a, a group of them got together uh, and uh, decided they won't be as well established at this time in 1924 um, and a group of people who was probably dragged together decided to form a team and try and uh, find opposition and that wasn't difficult, it, it gathered momentum. And so in the end, they, they established they needed a, their, own, uh, their own ground and clubhouse uh, because uh, the Wanderers, so-called because they wandered from, from uh, location to location to play, then had their own game. So they dropped the, the, the word Wanderers and became Chiltern. And the first uh, ground was by the Pineapple Pub, 
you remember that, Emily. That field next to the Pineapple Club was the first uh, ground for the Chiltern Rugby Club. And Teddy Turret Drake, who owned the, the ground, in those days, in 1924, they owned most of Amersham. So as well as giving ground to, or loaning ground to uh, the Cricket Club, I wouldn't be surprised if football comes in there somewhere. Uh, they uh, rented ground to the, the rugby club uh, down by the farmer's field. And it was a farmer's field, it was a cow field. And alongside the cow field were cow sheds, which acted as changing rooms for the team. Um, and the cows were shooed off the pitch um, before they played. You can imagine some of the collisions on the ground that occurred would be extremely unpleasant. Uh, that was uh, a guy called Forward, who was the far farmer, and uh, the owner of the publican of the pineapple uh, gave or provided teas at a shilling a time for each of the players. But then the club moved to Whedon Road and rented ground from the Turret Drakes, and the clubhouse is still there. Uh, the pavilion was built in 28, 29. Uh, and, the, and they ran three sides, plus a schoolboy side, and being the only club in Buckinghamshire at that point. The club thrived, but rugby is not just about buildings and fields, it's about people, including referees, and, uh, and also uh, people who uh, are, were no longer, we're reaching the, the, the wartime, uh, no longer with us. Uh, this is a picture of Jack Greyburn. Did you know that? 22 members of the 60 members in Amersham uh, or Chiltern Rugby Club lost their lives in, in, the, se in the Second World War. Uh, one of whom was Jack Greyburn, who was awarded the BC for his gallantry at the Battle of Arnhem Bridge. And um, this is a, a painting, really, of that Battle of Arnhem Bridge. It's a heroic story. He led his troops uh, from the front they secured one side of the bridge and uh, couldn't secure the, the, the far side and were defeated and he lost his life. But there's a, there's a corollary. Uh, we remembered this in the clubhouse as well as our, um, in, in our membership. And 2014, we had a tour to Arnhem and uh, to honour Jack and his colleagues and cronies uh, on the Battle, uh, the battle of Arnhem. And with us, they were the first 15, uh, vets, older, older vets hanging on to watch, and a bunch of under 15s came out to Arnhem. And he was really good at the, at the war uh, grave uh, with a speech by President Chris Smith. Uh, and it was very moving. And it's good to see the under 15s appreciating that and respecting uh, the time there. Uh, then, uh, in uh, shortly before that, that shouldn't be there. Um, the club moved to Whedon Lane, uh, and in 19, that's for the 1928-29. And but shortly after that, well, it's 20 years after that, it, the clubhouse burned down. But at that time, the club was running uh, three sides plus a schoolboy side, and the club thrived. But as I say, it was not just about referees. The pavilion was built, burned down and rebuilt, and, um, and, and is still on that site. Now, one thing about rugby is that it's quite different to football. It uh, respects the referee. Now, I know that uh, Richard is a, is a well-known referee locally, and he understands that completely. Never an argument. They, uh, they obey the referee. They don't crowd around and challenge his decisions, tell him he's wrong. Uh, they may look at him. And if Martin Johnson, the ex-England and, and Lions captain, would look at a referee, it would wither with his look. Um, so referees too have their place. And the spirit of rugby it was born in those times and continues today. The spirit is actually the, one of the things that uh, attracts most people to rugby. And of course, um, rugby is not just for adults, uh, the same as in the cricket ground. We run active uh, a mini section. This is a bunch of minis. I was able to show this film or this slide knowing that most people in there 
I hope all of them are now in their 30s. So there's no worry about identifying children um, on this one. So we have uh, minis and juniors and in Chesham, they have a ladies team. We don't, sadly at Chiltern we don't. But Chesham was broke away from Chiltern and formed a team down uh, representing the town of Chesham and it's still there and, th and thriving though. That's a great initiative. And, it's, and uh, it, it started the ladies team and there we are. That's one of the penalties you play. And nobody should question me on the state of the hair or the lipstick, please. That's a rugby game for women as well as uh, men. Now we have stars too. Many, many um, stars in the junior side who have gone through the ranks to uh, the England setup in their age groups. Uh, but these, the, the, the one on the left, Joss Lucy, uh, played uh, fullback for England <coughs> during the famous 20, 20, 2003 um, World Cup. And he, uh, uh, we're very proud of him, he often comes back to the, to the club. He was, uh, went through the minis, the juniors uh, and the Colts before moving on to bigger things at Wasps. And his Wasps colleague, Joe, Joe Worsley there, came with him uh, to, uh, to present Amersham with this, with this lovely big new sign. Now, it wouldn't be uh, right for me to ignore the other end of the spectrum, including the, the Vets team, uh, an unholy group of ageing men reliving their youth, and of course, touring. I could spend 20 minutes talking about each tour, um, but it, that, would, that wouldn't be appropriate, because most of the tales involve things that should never, ever be disclosed again. What goes on tour, stays on tour, they say. It's always been an important part and, uh, oh, follow me, um, there are a couple of reprobates you may recognise, uh, being silly. Uh, this, is very, this is the only photograph I can find of the whole, or the whole lot, uh, which is decent and, and, and can be shown. Uh, dear old Simon Curtis on the left, uh, he sadly died of COVID last year. Um, we miss him greatly, he was a great stalwart of the club. I don't know who the chap on the right is, he'd love to be ignored with a bit of luck. And, oh, finally, uh, this is the uh, group of vets at the end of a tour. Uh, only, only seven survived, and here they are. And uh, this illustrates some of the fun, the things we can get up to in rugby as well as uh, on tour, uh, on the field and off the field. There we are. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Um... Very interesting. Uh, who has, does anyone got a question about the rugby club? Annie, you've got your hand up. No, so what that. position did you play, uh, Mr. Well, since you say that, I, I joined the, <laughs> I, I was taking my son to the minis and juniors and was standing at the bar and a chap sidled up to me and said, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Tony. I don't know. He said, I heard you play rugby. You played the rugby. Well, your chest swells a little bit. Yes, I did play. Uh, yeah. He said, well, we're short on Saturday. Do you fancy a game? And they were short of a winger. I'd never played winger. I was either a fly half or a centre. But anyway, and I played every week from then on, apart from injuries, as we all pick up on the way, for the next uh, six or seven years. And it was the best rugby I've ever played. Most fun and uh, a great bunch of guns. So I played with the vets on the wing or fullback. I didn't know your speed. No, it doesn't show much, does it, these <laughs> Valerie. Um, yeah, it sounded as though um, you were struggling more to get teams together. Is this, do you think perhaps rugby's losing a little bit of popularity? Maybe people are more concerned about the injuries or what, what do you put it down to? It's a very important, good and important uh, <clears throat> question. Uh, rugby, like many, in fact, most organizations, never mind about sports organizations, most organizations are suffering from uh, a dearth of um, a, a younger people, put it that way. Uh, we all look for younger people and we always have done. And usually younger means um, in terms of running clubs and organizations, uh, uh, not more than well, 60, 60 is young. But this, the, on the playing side, unlike cricket by the sound of it, which was, was the first club I've come across has actually grown and thrived. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to run, when I joined, seven sides. We're now struggling to run two. 
And this is a, a club that's relatively successful in the junior era. And I don't know quite what the answer to, answer to that is because mm -hmm. all the sports are suffering. Cricket, I, I'm staggered to find how successful they are. Mind you, the, the lovely ground down by Shardlow's Lake is, 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 is a wonderful setting. Maybe that's part of it. But I, I, I don't know that there is a cure. And I think injuries, the injury rate at senior level is a, a huge factor in there. We, I know uh, a few months ago, last year, probably two years, forgetting the, the uh, COVID gap, we had three players being assessed in the clubhouse. This is little old Amersham and Chilton, as it now is, being assessed in the clubhouse for um, head injury. Uh, and you can't sustain that uh, at our level, or indeed at any level. How many, mm -hmm. how many players at senior and premiership level now are uh, suffering? And, uh, it's, it's a terrible, mm -hmm. and they're going to have to do something about that. Yeah. yeah. And, and yet, and, Gary, there are, there are hordes of minis and juniors, aren't there? Hordes and hordes. On a Sunday morning, you could have, I don't know, 200 minis and juniors. And we have big tournaments. Uh, the, the difference, of course, is that the, the very young kids uh, play either tag rugby or touch rugby. And so they don't have the contact. And it's not contact, full contact doesn't come really until they're 11 or 12, uh, by which time they've played for six or seven years, maybe, uh, or let's say six years, maybe. And uh, by the time they get to um, the first team, say, They've had a lifetime's rugby, and I think that's part of it. But there are loads and loads. Of, but who knows? I mean, we've got to safeguard those, I think, Stuart. Safeguard those minis and juniors, because parents uh, be, are, will become and are becoming uh, concerned about the potential injuries. Mm. That's it's really interesting hearing you say that, you know, as a parent of children that age, thinking about it, because it's definitely something that comes up sometimes. It's, I think, that's something that people think about, um, talk about, certainly. So I think there's some truth in that, probably. Yeah. Does, it, does anyone have a question for Gary? I was fearful that Williams would test me on a, on a <laughs> something. <laughs> Peter Williams, by the way, was the, in the in your on your screen. It was the chap on the right of that photograph with the with the silly thing on his head. Yeah, he went to Ascot with that on, apparently, some years later. <laughs> as a as a jockey. <laughs> uh, uh, Emily, could, could could I just respond to your um, point there, if I may? Mm. Uh, the, the the there was a, an article in the Times this morning, actually, about. Um, World Rugby really trying to get hold of this, you know, very worrying issue about uh, the frequency of injuries and the type of injuries in rugby. And they're going to be trialling a number of new laws uh, next year to try to create more space on the field, to try to reduce the number of, you know, heavy uh, collisions and hits that uh, take place, all really in the name of uh, making the, the game more palatable and more acceptable. And uh, hopefully with, you know, with fewer serious injuries in the, in the long run. So it is, I think as Gary rightly says, it's probably the most important issue facing, facing the game worldwide at the present time. Mm. Well, that's really interesting to hear. And it is reflected in other sports, isn't it, too? You know, like with heading the ball in football, yeah, that's yeah, become yeah. a big issue. I had to, I just David and Richard both, I played with both of them and, and for the Chilton Vets. David was a very, very good, rugby player and so, so was Richard and I, uh, I thrived in their shadow. <laughs> very modest. True <laughs> Gary. <laughs> if you want to end it on a lighter note, in the late 60s and early 70s I was part of a disco who played weekly or bi-weekly at Chilton Rugby Club for five pounds and all the beer you could drink. <laughs> And you made a loss. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, right, our final speaker has just been very, um, uh, been complimented really nicely by Gary, is Richard Keane. Uh, and he's going to tell us a bit about Amersham Football Club. Uh, Richard was born and brought up in Amersham and has lived here for 
most of the past 30 years. Uh, as a child, he was regularly taken to the club by his father to watch the Magpies, and later he briefly played from the club when he was at home from university. Um, besides football, as Gary mentioned, he's played rugby, but also cricket and golf at Amersham clubs, and he's really interested in local history. So I um, am going to do the slides for him because he has uh, a little injury. Um, so... <laughs> Um, there we go. Okay. Great. Hand over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, and uh, thank you to Emily for uh, uh, agreeing to uh, run through the slides, which will save, save me uh, the embarrassment of making mistakes. Uh, and uh, I can assure you my injury is nothing to do either with rugby or Amsterdam Town Football Club. Uh, it is uh, just old age, I'm afraid. Uh, and on the thank yous, I should also say thank you, first of all, to uh, Mike Gagan of Amersham Football, uh, Amersham Town Football Club, uh, who was very helpful and provided photographs uh, and also, I believe, wrote the excellent uh, history that's, uh, that's on their website. Uh, what I plan to do uh, is to talk uh, about uh, the football club, uh, but also to end up talking about football that was going on generally in, um, in uh, the Amersham area. Uh, as well as uh, just at uh, Amersham Town Football Club. Uh, but uh, as you've heard uh, in respect to cricket and football, uh, life uh, as a football club uh, and, as, and sporting interest started at an early stage at, uh, in Amersham. Uh, and on Friday the 10th of October at 1890, uh, in 1890, a group of uh, men sitting in uh, the Crown Hotel, uh, probably after a few drinks, decided that Amersham should have a football team. Uh, the Reverend Cooper, uh, who was uh, a friend of the famous cricketer W.G. Grace and who also at the time was the headmaster of Dr. Challoners, uh, formed a committee chairing it uh, and they promptly uh, appointed the squire, of course, the Terwitt Drake family, uh, as president uh, of the club. The membership fee uh, was decided at the vast sum of one shilling and sixpence, which I'm uh, regularly told is worth seven and a half p in modern parlance uh, and uh, uh, the membership uh, uh, also uh, included an agreement by all the players that they would not wear nails in their boots and I'm sure that both uh, their teammates and the opposition were very happy that that was agreed on. Early times at the uh, uh, football club matches were played at Barn Meadow uh, and uh, the first match that uh, Amersham ever played uh, uh, was uh, against <coughs> uh, Wickham Meadow in November 1990 uh, and sadly Amersham lost. That started a tradition of losing the first game of the season. They actually lost 2-1 which uh, they have maintained over many many years and I can verify that because I played in one of those in the 1970s and despite my best efforts in goal we lost. So that is uh, uh, one of the few proud traditions that, uh, uh, that has still been maintained. Uh, you can see here is the minutes uh, of uh, uh, the very first meeting. Um, I don't think I'll tell you much more than what I've said. Uh, perhaps we move on to the next picture, if possible. Uh, this is uh, a picture from uh, the, I think, 1892, uh, which was uh, one of the early uh, games. Uh, played by the club and it was in fact the first one they travelled away to uh, because the railway had recently been built uh, and they took the very lengthy railway trip to Wendover uh, and uh, lost in Wendover. Uh, you'll note that uh, the shirts are a multitude of different colours uh, and the best that anyone could manage uh, at that particular time uh, and uh, uh, a stark contrast to uh, the teams that uh, we've recently been watching with great interest uh, uh, on the television. Um, on the field, Amersham enjoyed some, a good deal of success in the early years before the First World War. At that time, they won the Wickham and District Combination League in 1903, the Aylesbury and District League three successive years in a row, and then they actually beat Chesham in the final of the Bucks and Barts Cup uh, in 1914. Uh, unfortunately, it's true to say that uh, that uh, tradition of winning 
trophies has not been uh, has sadly not been maintained. Um, after the war, the club uh, wanted to find its own ground, and they achieved this in 1920. Uh, when Squire uh, Turbot Drake, Teddy Turbot Drake, that is, leased Spratley's Meadow to the club at the King's Ransom of £10 a year. Uh, if you go on to the next photograph, because this photograph is just, that you're looking at at the moment is, is just a social occasion, uh, and probably the attire and the hats uh, tell you more about uh, uh, the jovial nature of, uh, of that game than anything else. But if you go on to the next photograph, uh, you'll see in the top left-hand corner uh, that... Uh, uh, one of uh, uh, Teddy Turwick Drake's uh, young daughters, Diana, uh, is seen kicking off the very first match that the town uh, ever played uh, at Spratley's Meadow. Uh, and I'm struggling to tell you much about the second photograph because the sun has just come in and I can barely see it. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's a picture of early days at Amersham uh, uh, Football Club. So... Uh, Moving on, uh, in the early 30s, still the players who now you can see look far more like a, uh, an ordinary football team, all in the same colours, uh, but sadly not changing at Spratley's Meadow. They were still changing at St Mary's School um, opposite Barn Meadow. Uh, that obviously had to be addressed and uh, dressing rooms and a stand were added to uh, Spratley's Meadow uh, and the stand was built by Alfred Woodley, uh, again a very famous uh, local name, uh, who became chairman of the club. But still, there were no showers and uh, toilets. Um, I remember the stand quite clearly because, uh, as Emily said at the beginning, as a youngster, uh, I was uh, uh, dragged, I think, off uh, to, the, uh, to the football ground by my father. Uh, I sat in the stand on many freezing uh, Saturday afternoons, uh, armed only with a Vimto and a packet of uh, crisps, uh, and wondering when I was going home uh, and life might uh, get a little bit warmer. Uh, but uh, I remember the stand with, uh, with great affection. Unfortunately, the stand um, didn't survive the storm of 1990, when the wind lifted it up and took it almost one piece across the road, school lane, uh, into what is now the, the youth pitches for the football club. Uh, and uh, it was only um, in 1997 that the stand was rebuilt with a, a more robust uh, structure. Uh, there were various discussions over a period of time about uh, leasing uh, the ground uh, further. And you can see there's the sign, uh, sorry, the picture where uh, a new lease is being signed. Uh, and uh, you can see that... Uh, 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 the field at the back uh, of the football club uh, has also uh, been uh, acquired on lease uh, so that uh, the youth teams uh, could play there rather than just having to use the main, the main pitch. Uh, but still, with the history, and in particular uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the clubhouse, during the Second World War, uh, obviously football didn't uh, continue and take place, uh, but uh, the football club were asked, uh, or probably told uh, in reality, uh, that the changing rooms were now to be used as an emergency mortuary in the event of an air raid on Amersham. Uh, shelves were actually installed uh, in the uh, clubhouse, uh, ready to accommodate the bodies. But uh, fortunately, uh, they were never needed, uh, and Amersham survived the war relatively uh, unscathed. Uh, in 1968, the club managed to acquire a disused timber classroom from a girls' school, uh, and that was their first clubhouse. And I think if we go on to the next photograph, we will see... Oh, that's the, that's the changing room, uh, and that's the pitch. Perhaps we can move on to the next photograph. I think we'll show the clubhouse. That now shows the new clubhouse, because whilst the timber clubhouse uh, did very good service for many years, uh, it obviously uh, had to be replaced, uh, and... Uh, uh, you are now looking at the new one uh, in the top right-hand corner. Uh, during the 70s, uh, the club really struggled, uh, both financially uh, and football-wise. Uh, and uh, in 1972, uh, I hasten to add that was a couple of years before I actually played for them briefly, uh, the club lost 
23 successive league games on the bounce. Uh, not a record to be envied. Uh, and uh, for some reason, Amersham rarely uh, in recent years has ever uh, hit the bright spots, the highlights that one would expect for such uh, and well managed uh, uh, ground. Uh, debts continue to rise uh, and uh, finances uh, were a, a constant problem. Uh, Graham Taylor, the ex-England manager, ex-Watford manager, uh, a match was arranged uh, against Aston Villa when Taylor was the manager there. Uh, they played that uh, at Cheshire United's ground so that they could get uh, a, a bigger crowd and uh, raise more funds, uh, which they duly did. I think they had a crowd of over 2,000 people. Uh, and predictably, Villa beat Amersham Town. The score was possibly not so predictable. It was 12-0. But Amersham, uh, with, that, uh, uh, with the funds raised by that, managed to uh, uh, sort themselves out financially. Uh, they renewed the lease on Spratley's Meadow, which you've seen the photograph of earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, they have, since that period of time, spent uh, a lot of time and effort uh, in sorting out the pitch. Uh, when I first uh, played there, there was an 11-foot drop uh, on the pitch, uh, which uh, made for some interesting uh, situations. Uh, but uh, uh, that's all been resolved now at uh, uh, considerable uh, effort and expense. Uh, and they acquired the ground, the, what was a field, and, and in fact it was a, an allotment, the other side of School Lane, uh, so that uh, school, uh, not school, sorry, uh, youth football uh, could be played and hopefully uh, would provide players for the future. For Amersham Town. Now there's quite a story there and they acquired this because they were told that they couldn't possibly have the ground uh, or that field uh, as a ground because it was still being used uh, as an allotment and they would have to find an alternative space for the one remaining tenant of the, of the allotment. So they thought that was going to be a serious problem. Uh, they went round to see the allotment holder and asked if he'd be prepared to move and that they would find him another place uh, uh, wherever he wanted uh, as an alternative. His response was, don't you dare provide an alternative. I've been trying to quit this allotment for years, but my wife won't let me. Uh, and he promptly uh, told them uh, that uh, the version they were to tell him was that there were no other alternatives and he would just have to give up his allotment. Uh, which uh, he broke the unhappy news to his wife uh, later, uh, and he was a very, very pleased man. Uh, over uh, many years, uh, Amersham continued to uh, struggle football-wise. Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, they even uh, uh, roped in the services of the town mayor. I don't know what date that was, but it looks to me to be reasonably recently. Uh, and uh, I think that was possibly even the centenary game, whether it was the 100th game they lost, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but things do seem to be, uh, at last, hopefully, uh, on the up. Uh, they have very, uh, a very new clubhouse, and you can see the pictures there, uh, which uh, hopefully will help them uh, with their finances. But also they've established links uh, with uh, the King's Church Football Club, which provides football for many of the younger age groups um, and uh, also uh, soccer coaching uh, for youngsters throughout school holidays. Uh, and I think a visit to Spratley's Meadow during school holidays would find uh, 40 plus uh, boys and girls practicing schools uh, on the youth pitches. So whether Amersham Town will actually uh, benefit from that. Uh, they wait to see because it may well be like the rugby club. They'll find that uh, uh, the vast numbers uh, of uh, youngsters come along, uh, but uh, so many of them leave the area to go off to college, university, uh, and can't afford to come back. Uh, and so whilst all your youth seems to do extremely well, very few actually make it uh, into the first team for any particular length of time. But Amersham uh, has, for, well, Amersham Town has fulfilled its purpose of uh, providing football. It's a bit of a mystery as to why they haven't done as well as they should have done. 
possibly because I think they looked outside of Amersham for a long period of time. and Maybe there wasn't the tie-in with some of the local schools but, uh, that would have helped. Uh, but Amersham very much is a sleeping giant uh, and they have uh, now excellent facilities, beautiful ground, uh, and I'm sure the future uh, should be better for them than, than, than the past has been. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, Amersham, I think, struggled on the, foot, on the playing side was that uh, uh, they were in effect in competition uh, with local football, uh, which uh, uh, was played to a very high standard in the Amersham and Chesham Sunday League. Uh, and there were any number of talented footballers uh, who, if they had played for Amersham Town, uh, I believe, uh, would have uh, contributed to a successful team. Uh, but the Saturday matches didn't seem to appeal quite as much, probably because of time, travel, uh, and all sorts of uh, uh, issues like that. And some of them uh, may even have been playing uh, further afield uh, for other Saturday teams. Uh, but uh, those of you who may have watched uh, the local Sunday league football, uh, such exotic names as Dynamo, Santos, Pioneer Scouts, uh, all uh, were very successful and even competed uh, on, in national competitions and, and, and did extremely well. Uh, and uh, uh, Sunday football, uh, certainly in my times as a, as a, as a footballer, uh, was very much the, 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 the prized uh, competition to be in. And I have to say, uh, finally, uh, that uh, I very proudly am the owner of the 1974 stroke five uh, winner's medal of Division One of that particular league. Uh, that was the top league in those days. No one had ever heard of a Premier League uh, in 1974. Uh, and that now rests uh, in my downstairs blue uh, with pride of place. So football in the local area has always been strong, sadly not always at Amersham, uh, but it is a, a, a strong club with a great history. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Really interesting. Um, has anyone got any questions? I, I've just got a comment, if I may, Emily. Yeah, of course. Uh, Richard just at the end there referred to the um, Chesham Sunday League, which I remember in the 70s probably had 40 or 50 teams at various, at various levels. Uh, and maybe with the answer to the, the question that he was posing was, is in the fact that that league doesn't exist any longer. So if those 50 teams times 11 plus helpers, you know, that doesn't exist. So what's happening to the boys that otherwise would have played in those... Uh, in those Sunday matches, where have they yeah. gone? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, so it shows that football, uh, rugby, you know, it doesn't seem to be so bad at cricket, but uh, uh, for, for certainly those two sports, the numbers of players participating has dramatically dropped. Uh, and whilst rugby might be something to do with injuries or concern over injuries, football, I would be surprised if that was really uh, the, the, the same reason. Maybe it's, it's time. Uh, people aren't prepared to spend you know, that, uh, uh, that amount of time. Uh, maybe it is that there are other things that are drawing them uh, and uh, possibly even professional football so that more people are prepared to go and watch people play at a higher level rather than participate in themselves. But it is a, a sad indictment uh, uh, on the fact that so many of us enjoyed such good times uh, and, and now people aren't following in that, uh, in that example. I think the family life has changed dramatically as well. In that, uh, as, yes. a, as a child, I was down at the Amsterdam Cricket Club every single weekend with my father, Norris Bazard, who is skipper in the 50s. But now expectations of husbands yes. um, not participating in sport for whole hours and hours at a time is not looked upon kindly, I don't think, by the wife, wives of today. That's not denigrating the wives, I hasten to add. But I think it's not become a family game as it used to, and everybody used to go down there and play. It doesn't occur, I don't know, um, Amersham Cricket Club might be different. But uh, it was always full of kids and siblings and all that sort of thing. 
And I don't think that's the case now. So lack of time and the different way of life, I think, is contributing to the lack of participation in sport. I think, Annie, that's exactly right. There's a direct correlation between the high numbers of children participating in sport and their parents not being able to. I mean, we spend our weekend mornings taking our children to play sport, which means we can't do it unless we leave them there, you know, and that doesn't always, you know, when they're little, you can't do that. So I'd say, I know I'm on the older side of anyone that would be playing in a sports team, but the majority of parents I know spend their weekends taking their, their children to sport, which is why the children are playing, but the adults are maybe not. So I don't know how you resolve that really, but um, when if the games are at the same time, it's impossible. Yes, yeah. I think there have been days uh, that uh, uh, you would go and play rugby on Saturday uh, and football on Sunday mornings um, are gone forever. Uh, I now appreciate probably some of the difficulties my wife would have had looking after the children on her own for that period of time uh, and possibly why now my sons and their wives will have none of that and none of them end up playing sport uh, uh, either on a Saturday or a Sunday. It's a balance, isn't it? Jill, you had a question. You just need to unmute. Um, I, I found it very interesting because back in the late 70s, my husband was chairman and I was um, treasurer for a couple of years, only on the basis that nobody else would do it. Um, we thoroughly enjoyed it. We were there when they first introduced the five, I can't remember the five asides or six asides, the very first tournament they ever had there, which was such an enormous success and did raise some money, but it was not easy at that time. The name is Roars, you'll find it in the programme somewhere else. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure that's, that, that's uh, uh, very much the case, that, uh, uh, that Amersham didn't attract as many people as it should have done, but those people like yourself who very kindly you know, fulfil the role kept the club going as it, it wouldn't have existed otherwise. Well, we used to take our son down. He was, he was um, well, he was about four, I think, when we first took him down there. So that he, because my husband was football mad. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm cricket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was an enjoyable time and we thoroughly enjoyed doing it. But then some other people came in who were more, well, to be honest, more capable than we were. And we happily handed it over. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We did. I think the choice is open for kids these days is so enormous. Yeah. Um, they can't do everything. And when the parents have to do the following, as Emily just said, it's, it's really tricky. But there's so much choice. Back in the 40s, it was rugby, cricket or football, maybe hockey. Um, but now there's... You know, the computer's taken over a lot of the attention of kids. And I think that's part of the reason why, why they don't get involved. Well, lots to think about. It's interesting, isn't it, to see the change and think about um, the history of all those clubs alongside social change, like some of the things we're saying, the kind of the way family life has changed and maybe technology too. Um, Thank you so much to our three speakers, to um, David and to Gary and to Richard. Uh, it's been really great having you sharing your knowledge with us. Um, I have done a super quick quiz, three questions. I figured you're all quite competitive. So um, do you want to have a go? I hope I haven't got anything wrong here. If I have, you'll have to send me, <laughs> send me off or something. So here we go. Oh, question one's lost its title. I think no, you can probably not. work out. Has it got? Has it lost its quest title? No, it's in the green, Emily. Oh yes. Oh sorry. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll assume that's everyone who wants to do it has done it. So you all got question one right about Josh Lucy. I think he's very much celebrated locally for having played at uh, Chiltern Rugby Club, um, and pretty much everyone was listening carefully and knows that Amersham Cricket Club was founded in 1856. 
We're a bit more divided about Amersham um, FC. Uh, the answer is the magpies, I think. Uh, so, um, so there we are, not the nuthatches or the crows. Uh, I did have to look up another bird that was black and white. <laughs> so anyway, um, well done everybody. Uh, thanks for doing that. So thanks and thanks for joining us today. And thanks again to our speakers. We're going to have a break for August. Um, and so the next local stories will be in September, so um, probably middle of the month. So the date will go on the website soon and then we'll just carry on monthly uh, from there on. We have got a couple of topics lined up and a couple of speakers for um, topics that we've done earlier this year where um, uh, people couldn't make it but were keen to share a story with us. But if there is a subject um, that you'd like to talk about or you'd like to know more about, that we haven't yet covered then please do let me know because we're we're trying to tie in with sort of events and things happening but if there's something you'd like to know about or a story you don't think is widely known then it would be really really lovely to hear it so thanks again thanks for coming and i hope to see you all next time <laughs>